All right, I'll try to uh, make this quick. Um, as you know, usually I'll talk for like 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, I've only got 15 minutes on this card before I dump it, but uh, I just wanted to make a quick thing today, uh, specifically on your uh, valve guide shaping. Um, first I wanted to talk, uh, I know I haven't done really an in-depth video. Um, this is not the best example of how to keep your work area. Um, like, see there's just two random burrs there, there's some stuff over there, so I'm not really organized to get into that as far as, like, what's needed, but uh, I will say this, is I pulled out the old rotary tool that that pair was uh, used for, uh, or that that tool was used for those two heads, um, and I've got a flex shaft running on it. I did put a better collar over the collet for this um, Because this eventually will wear out um, I'll go more into that when I do a real-time cutting video on this So of course see this flash rust will just appear Out of nowhere if it gets humid out. That's why I've got to oil these when I'm done. But anyway, so I've got my my kind of monster one here, at least relative to that one. So this is a quarter inch, this is an eighth inch. Uh, and that's that 500 thousandths egg. That's the only extended one I have. It can get into a lot of areas to make the job quick. And I did cut off a couple of inches. This was a six inch one, but the longer you go on this, it could go eccentric uh, and basically turn uh, crooked. Uh, that's common with the 8th inch ones, but there are ways of re-straightening an 8th inch shank. Like, if it's a little bent on you, you can press it against metal and kind of wind the RPM up and it'll it'll help a little. It's never really going to be perfect. And honestly, a set of these are, are like 12 bucks on Amazon, so... And that'll, that'll usually get to you the next day. Anyway, this it does become important because... In certain areas, like after you've opened up the short turn and this side of the guide, like how that one is mostly open uh, to that spec that's over 500 thousandths, is, it's helpful um, to be able to have that flex tool. And this thing is so easy to use, you can hold it like a pen and almost use one hand. Like I could be working on this while holding the camera, and I may do that when I do the real time video. Um, a few of the most important burrs on it, uh, you can see a spherical, um, a longer one, like a longer oval. It's a little more uh, concentric or coned kind of than, than like an egg shape. And then just a tiny egg, which is a version of, a smaller version of what's on the extended shank there. Um, I'll get into that in a second with how you're going to get around and to that. Uh, the longer one does become important. Uh, I don't know if you can tell from the video, but I have brought the height of the valve guides down a touch. Uh, part of the reason why I did that was if you hit the side with the large oval like I did, in one spot is that metal may get kind of like razor thin and you're wondering like okay well why make it shorter like aren't you still taking integrity out of it and the answer is well yeah but the thing is is if that metal is thinner it it's more prone at that point to possibly like get a crack possibly break off and possibly end up in the combustion chamber so even though that's shorter it's not so short it's just keeping that wall thickness to where it's less likely to crack so all right so now getting into what you're looking at here um you're not doing anything crazy you're taking uh let's look at a stock one you're basically just kind of focusing at the top of the valve guide and, and making that a taper all right that's basically all the shape is um 
that you're going to worry about. And I would do that before you really mess with the bowl area because you may open up your bowl and then shorten that and then realize this is just, it's just too much for the valve, you know what I mean? Um, another thing to make a note about is the pinch or the fin that's still kind of like a fishtail on these. I may leave it like that. That comes in the back. You may see ones that are like taller where if they are on a ported example, like an E7, they may have left the stock casting. Maybe they shaved some of the crap off the top. You can see those usually have some gnarly casting finish. Um, what that is, is that is technically a reverse swirl fin, or like I've seen it referred to as an Elkins fin. When it's in the front, I've seen it referred to as a Glidden. Um, but that's also been noted on the floor, so I don't know if some heads may actually have that on the floor. Um, basically what's going on here is you basically have swirl when your valve, obviously we're looking at this upside down, but imagine an imaginary cylinder here that represents the bore is swirl is basically the air coming out of the intake and think of it like a tornado with debris in it as far as what it's doing. It's basically like a cyclone of air. Um, having certain amounts of swirl uh, in lower lift numbers and not so much at high lift numbers, I'll get into that in a second, uh, is important for low-end torque. Uh, so an example would be like also a relatively low lift head, this is true. So like a, an application or engine build like this with, you know, just under 500 thousandths lift, it, it definitely can benefit from, I would say going over that, it may become a little bit different. But basically, uh, for an example, General Motors has, I'm sure if you know engines, you've heard, even if you don't, you may have heard the term Vortec, uh, or Vortec engine, Vortec heads, um, and they named it, it's a portmanteau of Vortex and technology, so Vortec, where they've created, I don't know if those have an actual swirl ramp inside of them, and a swirl ramp would be where this wedge starts further down the valve stem, so it's going to start to, you know, influence some swirl before it hits the tail end of it. Um, and this does have some effect as well, but uh, and more on that in a second. But um, basically, a Vortec head or certain heads may be designed with more swirl influence because that's like a truck head or a truck engine. And I'm pretty certain there's no such thing as a Camaro, Corvette, Trans Am, GTO, any LT1 or LS1. Well, LS1 is like that's out of the Vortec era anyway, but I'm pretty certain they never had a Vortec. It's a it's a truck thing because of the promotion of swirl. It also helps um, promote atomization. Um, the th other thing with atomization is that swirl at a higher lift, what'll happen is the fuel droplets can become larger and they get slung onto the cylinder wall um, and possibly not as combustible because the droplets are larger. Um, so that's kind of some information on swirl, like E7s are low on it. This scallop and this kind of helps coming over the center of cylinder here. Um, other than that, there's not much you can do. I have seen people put, I guess, what would be considered a glidden fin in front of the valve guide. So if we are cutting the roof down, and I haven't really taken material off the roof yet, but if you are, you'll see people do that. Uh, so back to this rear wedge that you'll see differently, like, again, this one looks more like a goldfish towel. That could be straight, it could be taller. Um, I have read, you know, I've been reading and studying based on people that have developed heads for NASCAR, particularly heads like um, for a stricter plate racing where they're going for economy or something. And that's what I'm going to get into next is the thing with a uh, reverse 
swirl fin like this or an Elkins fin is this does help improve like combustion uni uniformity as well as your brake specific fuel consumption um, or your BSFC and what that is is basically is let's say you have a certain amount of horsepower that requires a certain amount of air and fuel uh, from there where you're stoic like your AFR but as an example is it's basically your grams of fuel per your kilowatt hour of actual power so like 200 grams per kilowatt hour would be an efficiency of like I don't know what that is just like 43 percent or just over whereas like a diesel engine would be like 155 grams um, which is like over 50% and that's why diesels at cruising can get better fuel economy. So it's basically just making better use of that fuel uh, versus something that would either be wasting fuel, um, which could be considered again like higher swirl at high lift and that's also what this do does is it's also um, helping promote uh, swirl from spiking at higher lift numbers. So obviously probably with other swirl companions it would show more gains. Uh, the other thing to note about that is, I've heard this before, is your CFM does not necessarily always show up on the dyno or at the track. And people have even made notes about this reverse swirl fin may show like 15 more CFM on a flow bench, um, whereas they get it on a dyno or something and you don't see any horsepower at all. So that's the thing with flow benches and horsepower numbers is you may have a figure where you build an engine that's like two and a half horsepower per CFM um, and has a really good BSFC uh, and so on is running really efficient all, overall, but you may not see any power pickup. So I guess it would depend on the application, on on other head dynamics like how the tunnel works, how what's going on with the short turn, uh, because like the short turn even has influence on swirl. Um, but as far as this little mod, this little fin is that's what it's good for. Um, and they've they've taken apart engines and it's shown like better burn uniformity like how where the carbon is and everything um, Someone else like on another example of say like a Winston cup or a restrictor plate car back when you know where 425 horsepower was still a thing uh, Where that's still deep before cars weighed as heavy as they do now, but um, And that's racing like I just mean as far as like talking street power wise, but Someone did claim like two or two to three horsepower um, having that at the valve guide. Uh, so I would say do your own research. I'm not getting so technical into it, but it is one of those things you'll learn in internal combustion that is a more technical side of head flow dynamics and things like that. Uh, but that is kind of the fundamental thing that's going on is I would suggest learning... Um, more about like particular head designs and reading about swirl and particularly to your application if it's something that does require more low lift swirl like a truck versus something with high lift. I would say as far as high swirl being bad for higher lift and numbers is probably a carburetor would have a lot more trouble than like a port to port fuel injection system, maybe even a plate fuel injection like a Holly Sniper or something like that. Um, Either way, it's just something to consider, and when I do this real-time, I'll show more how to cut into it. It is a little tricky. Um, you can kind of work the tip of some of these burrs downward. They do still have kind of a cutting surface. So it's kind of like a... Just a little bit of a mod to throw into your valve guide shape that doesn't take long at all. But again, the literature that you could find and learn and read is really interesting, especially considering a head like an E7 could use uh, all the help it can get as far as that goes. Um, I'm pretty sure I covered just about everything as far as that and the actual valve guide shaping. Um, the other thing is, oh, 
it's not great for methanol. For gasoline, it works great, but as one example showed, like a thousand horsepower methanol car actually lost like 90 horsepower. The other thing is, is guys will gain horsepower by removing their swirl port. I think that mostly probably has to do with the either their flow bench number.